And if I may say so, about bloody time too. <laughs> How exciting to be in a room full of real people, wearing clothes below the waist <laughs> for the first time in two years. I'll just get some water. And I'm very sorry that Julia Copas couldn't be here and Anthony and Axagoru couldn't be here, but I'm very glad to have had the chance. Thank you, poets and players, for being behind the microphone today. So, since it's been referenced, we'd better start with this one then. Springtime at the boatyard. You can keep your cuckoos. We hear spring's first song in the sound of angle grind as brazen as a mating call across the yard. The saw blades and the welders working between weathers like a nesting bird and swarf as bright as daffodils on workshop floors. You can keep your catkins. We have rust like pollen on our skins. We walk between steel sheds and smell the fresh blue boiler suits of all the coming days when warmth will stretch our holes and make of summer evenings a shed for building this year's stories. So yes, some of my poems are um, about boats and the fact that I live on them. Um, but some of them are about joy and the, the pleasures of companionship, which we have all rediscovered through its absence in the past couple of years. So it is really joyful to get back in front of a live audience here at Poets and Players, which is such a brilliant place to do it. So there will be joy, I hope, and some praise here. But first, uh, death. <laughs> death stood at the foot of my bed. You're next, he said, just saying. He didn't look so well himself. I backed towards the door. I heard your footfall in the hallway. Your hand slipped the latch to give us both a start. Your whisper through the keyhole. At your back, love. Take my hand and run. Two. Society of Friends, this, this is true, I was travelling through Bradford Island on my boat and there was a Quaker meeting house there and I thought, yeah, I'll go along and see, see what goes on there. I was heartbroken. One often is in poems, I find. Uh, and I was, I was heartbroken on this particular occasion. So this is what happened. If I hoped the silence here would answer, I did not. I sat amongst them and I wept. An hour we breathed together, I felt dizzy and unhelped. There was a little coughing, every now and then a slow breath, in or out. The woman in the purple jacket stood and said, since Mary died, I have been thinking about grace. The loss of love is very sad. I have been thinking that in anguish we experience grace. We find it in the love of other people around us. She said, there were wild flowers on the table in a pewter mug. I cannot say that I was healed. I knew, though, what she meant. Enough deathbed talk. The business of our days is whether to endure the daffodils and slingshots or to praise. This steel bright season helps. A yellow beach in March. Spring sun on gulls and gables, for now the only business of our days is grubby shallows turned to plains of jade, the boats in harbour, 
bracken tousled on the hills, a body shifting in my sheets. Praise paddles in with every cack, settles into place. Sometimes it's otherwise. We wake stone still and cry for night to end the business of our days as soon as they begin and nothing stays but dirty plates, new forms of the impossible. Those days there is scant room for praise. So then, to business, when the day sticks to our hectic feet, we'll pull each other up until they're clear. Address the only business of our days. Hold strong. Hold strong. And hold to praise. Um, I've been pioneering a form of poetry that I like to call the stroppy historic. For there are many people in history that we learn from. And all of them have been members of the Awkward Squad. And one of those was Giotto, so I thought since we're in a gallery, I would talk about Giotto, the Renaissance painter, who found, like many of his time, that the boundaries of society were a little more flexible than they thought, and that perspective was not just about painting. Outside the workshop, toddlers tumbled by. They sent me here for beauty, said the courtier. Your children are so plain. Giotto laughed, a blacksmith's laugh. I made them in the dark, he said. The envoy blushed, unsealed his errand. His holiness commands a sample of your work. Indeed, said Giotto. We will talk as soon as Pietro's roof is done. The messenger leaned in and scowled. The Holy Father's business is to speak for God. Giotto snatched the scroll, returned it with a circle, compass perfect, in a single sweep of red. God! Speaks by himself, he said. Um, looking again at, at history, because in my former life I was an archaeologist, and so I, I naturally returned to history to look for explanations of why, why we're in the state we're in now. I can't find an exact parallel for Boris Johnson, I rejoice to say. Um, but I, I was looking for a way to write about Windrush and what had happened in the Windrush scandal. Um, and I was trying to write a very elaborate poem in which I set up a parallel. And then I realised it wasn't necessary because Cicero's case against Verres in 79 AD, 79 BC, as you will know, is an exact parallel. So this is called Cicero for Windrush, and it starts with two quotes. One is from David Lammy, the MP, who said on Twitter on the 23rd of April 2018, Home Secretary just said Windrush children can become citizens if they want to be. They were citizens when we invited them 70 years ago. And the second quote is from Cicero, the great Roman lawyer. And when such events take place, there is no one who is not aware that the state is hastening to its fall. When such things take place, there is no one who thinks that there is any hope of safety left. And he wrote that in 70 BCE. So Verus, all you need to know about Verus is he's a bastard. Yeah. <laughs> he was a Spaniard, said Verus. He was a Roman, said Cicero. Grown inside our empire. Served our legions. Ate our salt. And by his birthright, he deserved protection in the empire, by the empire's law. Your countryman, though colonised, he stepped off the salt fish boat that brought him to your honey island, Roman. In his mouth, he held the password, Rome, which offers safety anywhere across the world we made. And you, a governor, you knew he held that passport word, that talisman of state, that seal of nationhood. Your government owed shelter to a rehomed son. Instead, you strong-armed him for show. You stripped him 
in the forum of your city where he cried, I am a citizen of Rome, and flogged him without trial in Rome. At which he cried, I am a citizen of Rome, and tortured him with red hot irons. A Roman! As he cried, I am a citizen of Rome, and did it thinking that the plebs would say he was a Spaniard. You crucified him, spatchcocked in his agonies beside the bay, five miles of water for a thirsty man so he could lift his head and see the moated empire as he died. And as his tendons snapped, he cried to you for justice, knowing you unjust. I am a citizen of Rome. His name was Glavus, Spaniard, citizen of Rome, and better than the state he claimed, which called him Roman when he paid its taxes, Spaniard when he called its name. Listen to Evan's translations of Kavafi, which and Kavafi is fabulous. Go read Kavafi. Go read Evan. Um, reminded me of uh, the many translations of Lady Shonagan, who was the 10th century Japanese poet. And a bit of a cow, actually, when you read her poems. So many of them are lists. Uh, and so I was trying to imagine what it would be like to observe her. That's where this came from. Serving Lady Shonagan. Koi carp in mountain ponds, the drifting mist across Mount Fuji's skirts. You get the gist. Lady Shonagan is living her best life and making lists again. She grinds her ink on marble, settles silk that cost a geisha's ransom, dips her brush. Things that are dispiriting. Deeply irritating things. These include a child adopted who grows up to have an ugly face. A cat that fails to be entirely black. Rain at the Gosechi festival instead of snow, she's keen on snow. An old man nodding off. And herons. All are disappointing. Lady Shonagan is disappointed by a handsome man appointed to the Board of Censors. No idea. By pink robes worn in summer and by anyone who doesn't own a house sneezing. Lady Shonagan is irritated by an older woman who is pregnant and by very ordinary women smiling. Lady Shonagan's a bitch. She reckons nothing's more unlovely than a fly, but just as bad is snowfall on the houses of the common people. The weather's wasted on the likes of me. Moonlight shining into such houses, says the Lady Shonagan, is a great shame also. You earn your snow, it seems, by poetry, and not by walking home in it alone along the palace road, the water swilling sweet and cold between your toes, the path a moonlit dash of ink on white. Um, some of you will, will know some of the poems I've written about uh, boats and living on them, and a couple of years ago I wrote a thing for Radio 4 called Slow Machine, which was like a half hour poem piece. Uh, and it's quite hard to get the sense of it from just an extract, but I thought I'd just give you a bit of it. And basically the uh, trajectory is me making a journey through the country on my boat. And this is the bit where I'm going down the Severn, which is an amazing, epic river, terrifying river if you're a boater. Um, where I went across the Severn estuary under the two great Severn bridges that you'll know from the pictures, the ones that look like enormous egg slices, you know. City, what makes you this self? 
not the other. The boundary, the stubborn cast of hills, the river. The seventh season floating brings this river, seven. Goddess, eel queen. The tall masps, bone down in the banks, are text enough to tell us who is judged and who the judge. A wide and drowning water. Spitting silt at every turn. One rule on the river, the river rules. I ask safe passage, seven. I accept your terms. The harbour wall that cupped us like a hand around a lighter flame is gone. We're out and running with the tide, the tide, the tide, for Christ's sake, with a cargo of small cells. My boat. My boudicca of the tomato plants and golf umbrellas, pushing for the other side at dawn. My grubby ribbit, slender as a side hand. Tinker puts her rusted muscles to the test, fights seven like a ratter through the slime road where the currents slide across the hidden spits. Nose up in foam as if a hundred feet of water were her usual three and leaping glossy spinners. Throttles up to dash between the stanchions of white bridges thrown across her path. My golden hind of red geraniums. My lively flea, my tractor engine, slipshod craft. My plowshare, cutting furrows to the entrance gate. We're in! Seven turns away. The grey gate swings. The Gloucester and Sharpness is ready. Lays a sixteen-foot glass slipper at our feet. Tinker ties up with a tough man's hitch and settles in the company of swans where she belongs. It's all sweet water now. I'm going to read you two more. Um, this one is what happens when we get to the other side of Seven and we visited the boat graveyard which I urge all of you to go and see. It's amazing amazing place where boats were driven into the side of the seven to shore up the bank. But as I wrote it, as you will hear, I was also planning what I was going to say at my brother's wedding the following week, and I was rehearsing Sonnet 116. Don't take my lightness lightly. There is gravity behind it. This slow fix, this great meander that supplies the land's great wants, this fluid strength is what we borrow, what we lean against when love inhabits us. It alters when the alteration finds all right. And so it should. There is no ever fixed mark. The barks, the thing, the dot, the battle's tides, and if the river lets it, makes it small. Unlikely. When? Okay, last one. This is for Heather and Ed. Begin. You forget how fast it happens. How little say you have in it. Two glasses of house white, a sunny street, and you are ready for it. Both. Together, nearliness is swelling round the decks of Saturday. Love gets in the forearms, mostly in the little hairs. The tides of your own blood, refreshed and quickly current at his voice. The slope of muscle that just before of it. You barely know the shape of him, and not at all by touch, but here's a gathering, a swell. Well, bring it on. The crest of appetite. The breaker's shock and gift, the force which only works if you can swim with it. Ah, oh, Jesus, here's the catch and shift of everything, the giddy spin, like fish in millions, flicking into silver at a sound which only they can hear, like seas heard from a hotel window as the day breaks briny. Seagulls crying everything awake.